Morning. Man, it's good to be back. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we are going to be back in 1 Kings. We're going to start chapter 14 today. Uh, the title of the message is Behind the Mask, and that will make sense to you later as we get into the message. But let me ask you just real quick, how many people here absolutely hate these masks? How many people feel like you're suffocating? Man, I'm not kidding you. The whole I'm claustrophobic. The whole time I have it on, I'm thinking, mask, mask, mask. <laughs> It's like wearing a face diaper. I can't stand it. But um, I was thinking, though, as I was, as I was preparing this, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, we should be used to wearing masks because spiritually I think we wear one just about every day. Have you ever found yourself becoming or trying to be something you're not or someone you're not? And it's almost suffocating to you spiritually because you know that's not who God wants you to be, yet that's the role you play every day. And that's kind of what... Uh, we're going to be talking about today, but I'm going to try to do something I probably shouldn't, uh, and I don't know if I can, but uh, we're, I'm going to try to recap chapters 12 and 13 real quick just to catch us up uh, to where we are today at chapter 14, so here we go. Now, after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam became king. You guys remember that name? Ray Ray became king, and uh, he wasn't faithful to God like Solomon was when Solomon first became king. He was faithful, and he, he wasn't like that. I mean, basically, he was a spoiled rich kid. Uh, he was a brat, and he grew up to be a spoiled rich jerk. I mean, that's who he is. You know, he worshipped idol gods, uh, and he increased the labor, the forced labor that was placed on his people. He increased that. Uh, he was greedy and selfish. He was just a jerk. I mean, he wasn't a good guy. And uh, the people hated him so bad that a great many of them said, I just, we just don't want to follow you. We don't want you to be our king. You're a jerk, you know. And so the kingdom ended up splitting into two separate kingdoms. Right, And the two kingdoms were called the northern and southern kingdoms. Now, the northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. Okay, Now, ten of the twelve tribes went with Israel, and two stayed with Judah. Now, the kingdom of Israel had its capital, and of all places, Samaria, which if you know anything about the New Testament, that's like a detestable place to the Jews. Uh, but that became the capital of Israel, and the kingdom of Judah kept Jerusalem as their capital. Now, Rehoboam remained king in Judah, but Jeroboam, someone who used to serve King Rehoboam, uh, became Israel's king, all right? Now, it's kind of funny. He told Jeroboam something when he gave him those, king, when he gave him those ten tribes and, and he became the kingdom of Israel. That's kind of hard to believe. God told Jeroboam, he said, listen, if you will just be faithful, if you'll just do what I ask you to do, I will bless you as much as I blessed King David. Okay, now that is a huge, huge promise that God made to him. And for some reason, I haven't really figured it out, God must have seen some potential in Jeroboam, and that's why he made that promise to him. He must have seen something in him that he thought made him worthy of such a great blessing. So you would think that when you hear God himself through his prophet saying, just do what I ask and I'll bless you. And I'll bless you, not just the normal blessing, I'll bless you like King David, I'll bless you that much. But despite knowing that, Jeroboam wanted nothing to do with it. He was just as evil and just as disobedient as Rehoboam was. Now, Jeroboam became paranoid. And he was paranoid because, you see, the Jews were used to worshiping in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. And so he started thinking, well, if my people continue to travel to Judah and to worship in Jerusalem, where they're used to worshiping, what if they like it better there? What if they decide to stay in that kingdom, and that kingdom becomes bigger? And he got worried about that. Now, how, think how dumb this is to worry about this. Because if he would just do what God asked, he already said, I'll make you as blessed as David. He wouldn't have had to worry about people leaving, because God would have probably given him those kingdoms too. But he was really worried about that, and he was afraid they would leave his kingdom and stay there so they could worship in Jerusalem. So he decides to make himself, uh, to make himself a new god. New gods, actually. He decides to make new religion based on two golden calves as the object of worship. I wish somebody would tell me what it is with people in the Bible and cows. What's the deal? I've never seen people want to worship cows so bad, but he makes these two golden calves, right? The only thing I can figure is maybe they offer the milk of life. Okay. <laughs> that is so lame. I'm sorry. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know why they use calves, but so... What's really scary is the people of Israel just jumped right in and believed it. I mean, the people of Israel are like, oh, it makes sense. Save some gas. I'll just worship these guys, right? So he start, they start worshiping these golden calves. 
right? And, and it just blows me away that it was that easy for them to do that, right? Now, he decided he was going to appoint priests for his cow gods. And see, when you appointed a priest in the temple of God, they had to be from the lineage of Levi, and there were was, there was some things that had to happen. Well, the only thing that he required was that you want to be one. So basically, he's like, you want to be a priest? All right, you're hired. Get a robe. I mean, that's, that was pretty much it. There was no real criteria. It would, that was a, just a mockery to God. God just couldn't believe how far he'd fallen, right? And, and the funny thing is, when we read about characters like this in the, in the Old Testament, we're like, how stupid? How stupid can they be? How could somebody who has all these promises from God, how could they allow their faith to slide so fast? How could they worship other things before God? I mean, how dumb do you have to be when God has made those kind of promises to just ignore it and do your own thing? You see where I'm going here? I mean, it's kind of amazing. Jeroboam did what people still do today. He allowed fear to hinder his faith. If he would have just trusted what God said and did what God told him to do, his kingdom would have kept growing. If he would have just trusted God's promises, that kingdom would have thrived. I mean, just thrived. But he didn't want to wait on God's timing. He wanted it to happen right now. He wasn't going to wait. He's like, I know you got a plan. I know you got timing, but it just takes too long. Now, be honest. How many times have we been impatient with God? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, honestly, how many people in here have prayed, and after a day, you're going, where are you at, God? Anybody done that? How many people have done it after a half an hour? I'm right here. You're like, Lord, show me, and your faithful servant will wait because that's how I ameth. <laughs> and a half hour later, you're going, time's up. Right? I mean, we get impatient just like he became impatient. Right? And so instead, he figured his plan and his timing would be way better. You know, like Jeroboam, we disregard God's promises because we're impatient too. We do it all the time. I mean, we want everything our way right away. That's just how we are. That's what we want. And like Jeroboam, we devise our own plans because we're tired of waiting on God to tell us his, and they always end up being a train wreck. Look at this, Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Basically, what God's saying is every time you do this, it collapses. It's a train wreck. Just wait on me. But we never, we never want to do that, right? And here's the crack up. Here's the thing that kind of jumps out to me is, is God is so merciful to Jeroboam for some reason. I, and I don't, I don't know why, but he's so merciful to Jeroboam, and he sent him a ton of warning signs. And Scotty covered a bunch of them last week. I mean, he sends a prophet and says, here's what's going to happen if you don't stop, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam's answer is, arrest him until his hand withers. And he's like, wait, before you arrest him. Y'all want to heal this, you know? I mean, his first recourse, arrest the prophet. Then all of a sudden, a prophet is eaten by a lion, and they go out there, and there's a lion and a donkey standing, and the prophet eaten. And he doesn't take that as a sign. You know, can you imagine for a second? I mean, I, people go, well, why did the donkey just stand there? I'm thinking the donkey's going, if I stand really still, maybe he won't notice me because the lion's still here. You know, I don't know. But that would be a sign to me. Just ignored that sign. Didn't mean anything to him right? Sent him all kinds of judgments, all kinds of warnings. He just wouldn't listen. He just refused to listen, and he continued just to worship idol gods. Now, that catches up to chapter 14. I skipped some details, but you get the idea. Okay, let's jump in. First Kings chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, arise now and disguise yourself. Hmm. Disguise yourself or mask yourself so that they will Notice it says they, so that they will not know, sorry, just a second, so that, uh, I pushed a button and lost my outline for a second there. It says, so that they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh, behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people, take ten loaves with you, some cakes, a jar of honey, and go to him, and he will tell you what will happen to the boy. So Jeroboam's son gets sick. So he decides to consult with the Hydra the prophet. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind is, why don't you go see your cows? You know, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. You got those golden calves, why don't you go 
check it out with him. You know, but, you know, here's what he's thinking. He was hoping Ahijah would reassure him about his son's condition because, remember, Ahijah was the one that said, God would bless you like David. So he's thinking, well, God wants to bless me like David. Surely he'll help me with my son. That's his thinking. He's thinking, you know, God did make that big promise, but what he's forgetting is there were some, there were some things that promise was contingent upon. He did want to bless him like David if he would do the things that David did, if he would be faithful. But Jeroboam was not faithful to God. He was the polar opposite of faithful. I mean, Jeremiah didn't have a shred of the faith that David had. And Solomon had faith when he first started as king. He didn't have a shred of that faith that Solomon had. I mean, he didn't have any of that. I mean, Solomon's faith obviously faded later. I mean, the guy had 700 wives. Why? And then 300 concubines. Why? Can you imagine his honeydew list? It's no wonder they said he inscripted labor. He's like, oh, my gosh, one of my wives has another job. Lord, let's force labor on these people. Listen, I don't know. He just faded. He faded away. So later in his reign, he become really unfaithful and started worshiping idol gods. So I kind of believe that Solomon's unfaithfulness likely influenced Jeroboam's lack of faith. I mean, listen, the kids are watching you. They're going to do a lot of things that you do, and I just think that that's probably why he ended up being such a faithless jerk, right? Because that's what he saw from his dad. But nevertheless, Jeroboam still wants, you know, cares about his son, so he's going to take a shot and send his wife over, you know, disguised, masked, to see if he can, you know, cheat a blessing out here. See, when I read this, I think, you know, God made a similar promise to all of us, any believer, but that promise also has conditions. And the reason I bring this up is this scripture is thrown in my face all the time. So Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together, see this, for good. To those who what? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Do you see the contingency here? Do you see it? See the conditions God put on this? He said he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. That's the condition. That's the condition on God working all things out. Now, I hear believers all the time trying to claim this promise. And it cracks me up. It's people who have nothing to do with God. They may believe, but they're, they're not faithful to church. They're not faithful to read. They're not faithful to pray. They do a lot of things they know they shouldn't do. But when something goes wrong, when something starts to go bad, all of a sudden they say, well, God said he'd work all things out for me. No. He said he would work all things out for those who love God. Jesus says in John 14, 50, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So what he's saying basically here is believers that are living their own way instead of God's way, they have no claim to that promise. They are reading someone else's mail. Okay? He did not promise you that. He promised that to people who are loving God or trying to do what Jesus asked them to do. You know, and isn't it funny how when we want no part of God until we need him. And I think everybody, Christian and non-Christian, are guilty of this sometimes. But, you know, we, we're content with doing things our way. God, we got this. Until something goes wrong, someone's sick, someone's hurt, we're losing a job, losing a home, then all of a sudden, we need God. I mean, we don't seek his guidance, we don't read his word, but trouble comes, and all of a sudden, we expect. We don't want, we expect a blessing from God. And if we don't get it, we're mad. Where are you at, God. I've heard so many people say that to me. They're not living anything remotely close to a godly life. They've abandoned all their faith. And then something goes wrong and they pray and say, see, God let me down. He's not answering my prayer. And I'm like, well, don't talk to your wife for three years and ask her for something. See how that works out for you. You know, think about this for a second. This is what happens. We we have nothing to do with them. Then all of a sudden we're mad. I can't believe God did this to me. I mean, listen, if you stay close to him, this wouldn't be a problem. So when I see Jeroboam doing this, and I, you know, I hear people saying how crazy that he would do those things, I think we do just about everything he did in one form or another. I just think we do, you know? So let's jump back into the story. 1 Kings 14, 2 and 3, let's read that again. Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam. And go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people. Take... Ten loaves with you, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him, and he will tell you what will happen to the boy. 
So Jeroboam tells his wife to mask herself or to disguise herself. The word mask just means that you're hiding something or, or you know, trying to keep something from being exposed, right? So he says, go and visit Ahijah to the prophet and, and don't, but dress like somebody else. What does that mean? I don't know. I mean, the, the glasses with the mustache, I don't know, maybe, maybe different hair. I don't know what it is. You know, all the guy, you know, I don't know what the, what the costume was. He just says, disguise yourself. And he told her to bring the prophet some gifts, you know, and they, notice they were food gifts. Do you notice that? That's because all men of God like food first and foremost. We do. You want to get to our heart? Bring the cookies. Right? So it says take some food with them, right? But here's the thing. The fact that he wanted, to dis, wanted her to disguise herself says something about him. It reveals something. I mean, he obviously didn't want people knowing that he needed God's help. And he needed a high just help. Now think about it. How would that look? He created these two cow gods, right? And he's demanding everybody worship these cow gods. But the second he gets in trouble, he's not in the pasture with the cow gods, is he? No, he's sending someone to the true God. And I don't know if he was afraid of offending those followers that he had created. Or I don't know if he was embarrassed to admit that his, you know, his cow gods wasn't you know, filling the bill. I don't know what it was. But he didn't want people to know he was going, so he dis- wants her to be disguised. And he was so arrogant that he actually thought he could deceive God. He actually thought that putting a costume on his wife, she might go there and God go, well, I don't know who that is. Maybe I should bless her. You know? I mean, her kid's sick, whoever she is. You know? I mean, I... I it's amazing to me that he was that arrogant. He either didn't believe God could do it, or he didn't believe God would reveal who she was to Ahijah. I don't know, I don't know which it was. But he was wrong because that's exactly what God did. Listen, if you don't want to be deceived, if you don't want to be deceived, stay close to God and you will not be deceived. Now, I'll make that, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. But trust me, the closer you walk to God, the harder you are to deceive. Just remember that. Okay, so God tells Ahijah everything. Look at this, 1 Kings 15, 4. It says, Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now, Ahijah, listen, could not see, okay, for his eyes were dim because of his age. He was like Scotty's age. Uh, Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. You shall say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. When Ahijah heard the sound of her feet coming uh, in the doorway, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. (laughs) Can you imagine? This is hilarious. And she's like, Dang it! I'm going back to stoners and tell them this costume is terrible. (laughs) Think about this. Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent to you with a harsh message. Now listen, Jeroboam probably knew that he was blind. I'd say that wasn't a big secret. And he probably thought, you know what? This is going to be an easy one to deceive. He can't see. God's not going to tell him. He can't see. I'll just dress her up a little bit. It wasn't going to take much. The guy's blind. But what he didn't realize is that God looks out for his people. When you stay close to God, God looks out for you. You don't have to look out for you that much because God is looking out for you. When we completely trust in him, he actually becomes our eyes for us and sees for us. And the reason that's so important is that God sees things we can't. When we trust in our own sight and our own eyes, we are limited in what we can believe. But see, God knows how things are going to turn out. He knows what's happened in your past that has you where you are right now. And the more you trust him, the more he will guide you away from your past and into a future that brings success. If you just say, God, be my eyes. See the path that you want me to take, and I'll take it. See the dangers and warn me, and I'll turn from them. Just, Lord, be my eyes. Don't let me waste time being anxious and scared and worried about things I cannot change. When I know if I trust you, you'll see those things for me, and you'll guide me, and you'll warn me. God, please be my eyes. And that's what we're seeing. He becomes a hyjah's eyes here because he's trusting him. Right? Listen, when we're trusting God for everything, he sees the paths we're supposed to be on, puts us on them, and he warns us of any dangers. Right? Just like he's doing with Ahijah here. Look, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on what? 
your own understanding. Is that hard to do? It is. People always say, I have no problem just blindly trusting God. Yes, you do. At some point or another, you do. And you know why it is? Because we've got this arrogance in us that says, God, I don't know, man. I think i got a pretty good plan. I don't really know yours. It's kind of hard. But listen to what he says. And do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you what? Which path to take. See how he becomes our eyes? See, I don't think he understood that. See, God protects and uses all those who are faithful despite whatever weakness we may have. This man may have been blind and old, like Scotty. <laughs> but despite that, God says, I don't, I don't need you to be physically capable. I will enable you. I don't need you to be able to see. I'll see for you. Just let me handle this. You know, now as soon as Jeroboam's wife arrives, man, I, can you imagine when he called her by name? Can you imagine? I mean, she comes to the door probably ready to disguise her voice. He's like, yeah, come on in, Jeroboam's wife. I, I just can't imagine the, just the thought of fear that probably went through her mind, the surprise when she immediately knew she was busted. Right? She's probably thinking, did Jeroboam send somebody over? You know what I mean? Just completely knocked her out. God just told she was coming. So this is a crack up because Jeroboam had blatant disregard for God. We've seen it time and time again. We've seen it with the calves. We've seen it with how he wouldn't go to him in times of, you know, to make decisions. But his blatant disregard, and we see that and we're like, how could you do that? How could you blatantly disregard God? And we get all judgmental. We get all churchy. You know what I mean? We get all Christian people-y. You know what I mean? And when I say that, people go, I can't believe you're saying that. Yeah, stick around. You'll hear worse. But what I'm saying is we get that, that mindset where we read about stuff like this, or someone has something go wrong in their life, and we're like, well, that must be God's judgment if they live like me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Churchy people, like they don't sin. You know what I mean? Those people, I don't like them that much. Anyway, <laughs> you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times we see bl his blatant disregard for God's sovereignty, and we think that's ridiculous, but to be honest with you, it just looks really familiar to me. It looks really familiar to me. Again, it's shocking how much we act like Jeroboam. It's a crack up because we pretend to love God. We actually put this mask on. This mask that says we're something we're not. And believers, I'm talking to you. You know, when, when you pretend that you're faithful and when you come to church, you fool everybody because you got your church mask on. When you're around other Christians, you know what to say and what to do to make people think that God is at the center point of your life. When in your heart, you know you have so many idols before him. There are so many things that take priority over him that you're just hiding behind this mask of, of faithfulness that just doesn't exist. And it's suffocating, isn't it? When you're there, and we've all been there. When you're there, when you're putting on the God face for everybody else, but inside you're dying, it suffocates you just like these stupid paper masks suffocate me. You know? Because you're being something God didn't design you to be, and God can't use you until you are the you he created you to be. Then he can use you. You know, and so often we're just like that. We think that we can fool God if we fool all the Christians and peers around us. You know, it cracks me up. Oh, well, you know, if, if they think I'm righteous, maybe God will think I'm righteous. Listen, you can disguise yourself. You can wear a mask and hide your true self from everybody around you. You can fool the people at church, fool the people at work. You can fool family, but you will never fool God. You will never fool God because God knows what really matters in your life. He really knows that. He knows everything. He sees everything, and he's always in complete control. I've seen people get mad at God because he didn't do what they want him to do. And then they say, well, I don't care about his plan because I don't believe in God anymore. I don't care about his authority because I don't believe it. I've had people tell me that because that's their little Christian tantrum that people will throw sometimes. I don't believe anymore. <laughs> I got a newsflash for you. God's power, authority, all those things, his all-knowingness, I mean, his omnipresence, everything about God that makes him God, that doesn't depend on you believing in him. He's going to be God anyway. You know what I mean? You can take advantage of that or you can ignore it, but he's still in control. And he's still the one that makes all the decisions. Saying you don't believe just doesn't really matter a whole lot. It'll be his way eventually, trust me. 
You know, it's, here's the thing. We think if we don't, if we don't acknowledge God's power, if we don't acknowledge his place in our life, maybe we're not accountable to it. <laughs> That's just not the case. Ever try that one? Where you open up, you're mad at somebody, you open up the Bible, you read something and say, oh, I shouldn't be mad at him. I choose not to believe that. And God's going, I choose to still discipline you. <laughs> you know, that's just, I mean, it doesn't change anything. So the only person you fool when you put this mask on but refuse to really surrender your heart to God, the only person you're deceiving is yourself. Maybe some of your friends. You're certainly not deceiving God. And he's certainly not going to bless your life because of the quality of your costume. Trust me on that one. So Jeroboam and his wife are about to find out that God can't be deceived. Let's move into this. This is 1 Kings 14.7. There's a lot of reading here. See, he thinks he's going to get, the reason he thought he'd get a favorable prophecy was he really thought, you know, this is the same prophet that said God would bless me like David. So I'm going to go back and get that blessing. Like we said, he was reading the wrong mail. 1 Kings 14.7. Go say to Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil. Listen to this. You have done more evil than all who were, who were before you. Now stop for a second and look at that. You have done more evil than all those who were before you. Have you read about some of the evil that's happened up to this point? I mean, that's an accomplishment. The wrong direction, but that's an accomplishment. He's basically saying, of all the people that were disobedient, you're the best. That's what he's saying, all right? Worse than every one of them, Right? And have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and cast me behind your back. You ever felt like maybe you casted God behind your back? Because you're not looking at anything he wants you to look at. You're not not seeking his will, seeking his plan. You've moved on and left him behind you. That's what he's saying. right. Verse 10, therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel. I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away dung until it is gone. You know what dung is? (laughs) It's poop. So he's saying just like, just like a farmer will shovel out a stall and throw the poop out. That's what I'm going to do with your lineage and your generations of idol worshipers. I'm just going to shovel them out, sweep them aside like poop. Verse 11, anyone belonging to Jeroboam, listen to this. Tell Tell me that he hadn't lost favor with God in a big way, okay? It says, anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. Do you know what that means? That means dogs are going to eat them. They're not going to get the proper burial of a Jew or a Hebrew. They're not going to have the time of mourning. They will fall dead and dogs will eat them. You know what? Can you imagine that happening? And you walk by and go, hey, a dog is like eating a dude. That's Fred. I'm not going to help him. That dog looks very hungry. I mean, this was a huge disrespect. They're going to be eaten by dogs. Wait, it gets worse. And he who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat, for the Lord has spoken it. That makes my skin crawl, doesn't it? Think about that. I'd rather be eaten by a dog than be pecked to pieces by birds. <laughs> But basically what he was saying is there's going to be no honor in death for any of your people because they didn't honor me in life. There's going to be nothing for them. Think about this for a second. I, it's unbelievable when you read this, right? For the Lord has spoken it. This means it's going to happen. He says, now you arise, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child will die. Now, for all of you who are thinking, I can't believe God didn't help this child, listen carefully to this next verse. Okay, listen to this. Verse 13. All Israel shall mourn for him, this is his son that was sick, and bury him. 
For he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. So the only one in the entire lineage of Jeroboam who's going to get a, a, a mourning period and a, and a proper burial like the Hebrews were supposed to get was this boy who was sick. God saw something good in that boy. And you think, then why did he let him die? Because you know what? God knew what it would be like for someone good caught in a world that was so bad, in a family that was so bad, there was a great chance that young man could have been polluted by all the junk that was around him and all the idolatry that was around him. He said, no, he's got a good heart. I'm just going to bring him home to be with me because he's done something good. There's something good in him. The only one that got a proper burial. Verse 14, moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam this day and from now on. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from this uh, good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they have made their Asherim, that means idolatry, it's just a form of idolatry, um, they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam which he committed and with which he made Israel to sin. Now, God sent a pretty clear message here, a pretty clear warning of the price of his unfaithfulness. And God pronounced, I mean, impending judgment on Jeroboam and his family that's just terrible. But you know what's funny is up to this point, despite everything he's done, despite everything God said, if Jeroboam at this moment would have turned to God and said, you're right and I'm wrong. God, I have turned my back on you. I confess everything I've done. I'll follow you. God would have lifted every ounce of that judgment off of him. If you look throughout the Bible, there is time and time and time again where God pronounces serious judgment and the person hears that judgment and, and repents of their sin and turns to him in confession. And you know what happens? He forgives them. There's so many examples of that. Despite everything he's done, God still gave him a chance. He could have at this moment, he could have said, I'm sorry. All God has ever required from Genesis to Revelation to now, all he has ever required is that people confess and repent of their sins, and he will forgive them. That's all he's ever asked. That's it. He's never asked for anything more than that. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. That means the ashram, the, the idol gods, the cow gods, everything he had done could have been wiped away in that second. He had no interest. You know, God has never asked for more than that. And he doesn't ask you to confess to another person. People always say, well, i got to go make everything right with people I've done wrong. There is not enough time in a day and enough years left in my life for me to go make right everything I've done wrong. Aren't you glad he doesn't require it? God's like, be right with me. Here's who you have to confess to, just me. You confess to me, and we'll handle that. I mean, this is just like the most gracious offer ever known, and it still exists for anyone. There's nothing you can do that God won't forgive if you could just confess it. But Jeroboam just would not confess it. He just simply refused to admit that God's plan for his life was better than his plan. He just refused. So he continued to live disguised as someone in control of his life. But that was a mask, because he certainly was not. You know, sometimes I think we don't understand the significance of confession. Here's, confession is this simple. We've confused it. Different religions have confused it. Doctrines have confused it. And I don't understand. It's really a simple process. Okay, by confessing, you know what you're doing? You are taking the disguise off. You are taking the mask off, and you are revealing the true you before God. And here's who the true you is. It's, it's a broken person who cannot do this without him. That's who you are. I don't care what mask you're wearing or what you believe. Here's who every one of us are. We are broken and helpless without God. And until you can take your mask off and say, that is exactly who I am, help me. It's not going to get any better. But the moment you're willing to take that mask off, that pretending of being someone you're not and saying, God, here I am. I'm broken in need of your help. Cleanse me. You know, one thing I love to do in prayer is I love to pray God's scripture back to him. An old man told me this a long time ago, again around Scotty's age, and he told me, he said, listen, 
He said, God loves it when you remind him you know his word. First, it sounded kind of hokey. But one time I was praying, and I said, Lord, you know, I'm confessing my sin, and I, it was hard to say. I don't know why it was, but I'm like, you know what? And I'm going to thank you for your forgiveness. Because I don't deserve it, but you promised if I would confess my sin, you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I just don't believe you lie. So I know I don't deserve it, but I confess every sin I've committed. Thank you for cleansing me. That's confession. I mean, that's confession. And when we humble ourselves like that, God always comes through for us every time. Every time. Now, when Jeroboam's wife returned, everything God said would come to pass came to pass. Let's start in 1 Kings 14, 17. It says, Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tizra. And she was entering the thresh, or as she was entering the threshold of the house, the child died. All Israel buried him and mourned for him, just like God said they would, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Ahijah the prophet. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. The time, of Jeroboam, the, the time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his fathers. Slept was the Hebrew way of saying death. They didn't like to address death by any other means. But, uh, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Now, if you study the rest of Jeroboam's life, he died shamed and faithless. I mean, we knew that. We knew that was going to happen, right? I mean, and, and his young son who was sick was literally the only one that got a proper burial and got the mourning. He was the only one. God kept every word he said. It's just sad that he refused to heed any of God's warning. Again, he saw so much potential in Jeroboam, and I don't know what it was. I, you know, I have racked my brain. I wish I could stand up here and say, I'm pastor, I know everything. I don't. You know what I mean? I don't understand why he was so compassionate with that jerkweed. He liked the guy. He, well, he saw some potential in him. But the only thing I can make it, the only reason I can kind of make this make sense is maybe Jeroboam was a picture of us. Because the grace we receive from Jesus means that worthless people get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to make things right, even though they don't deserve it. And the angels in heaven, who you know, are a totally different creation, imagine the angels in heaven looking down. They might say some of the things we've said about the Old Testament. What is wrong with these fools? Why has God given them so many chances? They're terrible. You know? I don't know. That's the only thing I can figure, you know. Because he just kept giving him chance after chance. But Jeroboam just thought he had a better life plan than God did. You know, something we got to remember is that when God gives us opportunities to make changes, when God points out things in our lives that need to change, it's not him being on a power trip. He doesn't do that because he thinks you're a pawn on his chessboard. As a matter of fact, he has no selfish interest whatsoever. You want to know why God can be angry and it's not sin? Because his anger is not about him his anger is because he's afraid that you won't be the you he wants you to be do you know that when people say well, what about when god is jealous you know what god's jealous about our jealousy is wrong because our jealousy is about us god's jealousy is about him loving us his jealousy is because he wants us to have the best it has nothing to do with him it's about him wanting the best for us that's how much God loves us. It's hard to even wrap my brain around this. So when God gives us opportunities to make changes, it means that he's seen potential in you that he wants to bring out. He knows the mask you got on isn't you. He knows the life you're living doesn't depict the life you could live. And he wants that costume off. And he gave us his word so that we could see the blessings at the end of the road if we would just trust him. Yet we are just like Jeroboam and we want to do it our way. He even gives us the consequences of our sin. I mean, he even says, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And we go, eh, like Jeroboam. And we still don't make the correction that God wants us to make. It's like we see God's plan as a hindrance. When realistically, you will never experience your true identity in Christ until you do it his way. Then you'll know who you are. And I promise you, it's not insignificant and unimportant. I promise you, 
It's amazing. Do you really think that Moses thought he would lead the children of Israel away from the most powerful nation in the world? He murdered an Egyptian at 40, took off, was on the lamb for 40 years. He's 80 years old when he sees this burning bush. Do you really think he was 80 walking around going, I just can't wait for God to use me to deliver everybody? He wasn't thinking that. He's like, just waiting to die in the desert. And God says, come to me. If you'll trust me, I am going to show you who you really are. You're not a fugitive hiding in the desert. You are a deliverer who will make God's people free. And that's exactly what he did. I wonder what he would do with us if we would stop passing our opportunities and actually let God make us who he wants us to be and get rid of these costumes of who we pretend to be. I wonder what would happen. Here's the thing. We put all these things before God, and we don't realize how worthless they are until it's too late. You know, for the record, Jeroboam worshipped idol gods. Anything you put in front of God is your idol. Anything. I don't make me name it by name. You know why? Because I'm guilty of some of them. Anyway. I'm just saying, anything you put before God, that's your idol. And the enemy whispers in our ear, no, listen, you don't need that. Just go on with your plan. It's a good plan. The enemy is always trying to deceive us into believing that his way is the best way. And Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. I think that's hilarious. He's like, sure, you feel like you're right, because you're an idiot. Right? The fool, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but, wise, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. I just wonder how many times we've ignored the opportunity to do great things. You know, if you knew how many times God blessed you and you didn't even know about it, it would blow your mind. You know those times when you get trapped in traffic? And for those people, you know, who struggle with road rage (laughs) and you're so mad, you don't know how many times he saved you from an accident, how many times he's put you right where he wanted you to be at the right time. We don't know. And if God does that without us even knowing about it, and imagine what he would do with us if we just surrendered ourselves to him and said, make me what you want me, Lord. Imagine what we could do. So here's what it boils down to. Now, the truth is, our lives are an open book before God. They, they just are. They're an open book before him. And you can either try to hide behind a mask that fools everyone but God until the day you die and miss out on his best. You could do that. Or you can realize that life is so much easier when you share each line of that book with God and allow him to help you write the most amazing story with the most amazing ending. Those are our choices. And trust me, trust me, you want to have him writing that story, not you. I'm going to go ahead and close there. I'm going to ask you, would please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give an invitation. And the reason is, I just believe that there's so many times that there are people who just don't understand how simple this process is. If you're not sure where you stand with God, that's the easiest problem to resolve there ever was. And the reason is, is God wants a relationship with you more than you want one with him. All he requires is that you understand what his son did and trust that for your eternal life. And it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. If you need Jesus and you want him, you can have him today. So if you'd like me to pray for you while every head's down, just raise your hand and put it right back down or make eye contact with me. Bless those people. I'm not going to point you out. Bless those people. I won't chase you down after church. I'm too slow. I'm not going to email you, but I am going to pray for you. And if you're listening online or watching online, God knows your heart. But I'm going to pray because, listen, there's a lot of things in this world that are confusing, especially in the times we live in now. It is crazy. And every day I get more confused when the news gives me their quote-unquote facts. <laughs> I've decided to stop watching the news, except the weather. Got to watch that, right? It's confusing time, so let me make the most clear decision possible known to you today. Believe in Jesus, and he'll give you eternal life. That's it. And for believers, I want to pray for you because here's the thing. We get so pulled aside. People are taking sides in debates and arguments that mean nothing. You know what I mean? We are worried about things we cannot change instead of trusting God 
and letting his will be done. And the closer we walk to God, the less this other stuff that's got everybody freaked out really matters because he'll see for us and he'll direct us. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I'm always amazed that you could love someone like me. I do not deserve it. And there's not a day that I wake up that I deserve it. Every day is a gift of your grace. And I'm so thankful that you could love me despite me. Thank you, Lord, that you made eternal life as simple as faith in your son. And if someone here or watching or listening doesn't know you, I just pray that whatever's holding them back, they just push it aside and trust your promise that he who believes has eternal life. If they make that decision today, I just pray they reach out to us or a good church or a good Christian friend close to them. And God, for those of us who are believers, please don't let us get distracted. The enemy has so many things going on in this world right now that can pull our eyes off what matters. God, we know that the closer we stand to you, the safer we are. We know that nothing changes your plans, nothing catches you by surprise. And we know that things are progressing right according to your plan. Let us trust in that plan, be confident and let people see our confidence and know it's from you so that they might draw them to you. Let us live lives that reveal your love. God, we just pray as we leave here that you would keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, give us an excitement and a zeal to come back to your house and give you all the praise, honor, and glory so worthy of at least one more time. We just thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.